We still have time for questions now and a discussion. More, you want to, is that? You have to ask Carl, I think. More, <laughs> would you go to the microphone? If you want to, if you want to ask a question, either microphone, if one is being used, go to the other one and we'll alternate. Uh, that was quite extraordinary, Danny. It's good seeing you. Thank uh, you, Mort. Uh, <laughs> Murray Sherman, uh, who was a senior member, had, was a friend, a student, a colleague of Reich, and had written some very seminal articles that uh, we've all appreciated. Uh, in, those, in those interviews he had with the family in the, in the mid-late 60s, there was much that came out about uh, Reich's childhood. And Jenny, you referred to uh, f from 30 years with Freud, which is something there that comes very up, very important, I think, in reference to all the important things you said. It's his childhood that had a tremendous amount of conflict, according to uh, Murray Sherman and, and, and other sources, conflict and turmoil. His mother was a depressed lady who had lost four children beforehand, as some of, some of you know. Uh, his, he, his two older brothers, I think Otto and Hugo, were the favorite of his bon vivant father, so he was not uh, accepted there. And his grandfather, who came into his house, was very, is, and in, in, uh, from, from 30 years with Freud toward the end, how important proverbs that his grandfather gave him had such a tremendous impact on him. And the arguments between the agnostic father and the orthodox Jewish uh, father-in-law who lived in the house for seven years caused tremendous turmoil between with him and with his younger sister Margaret and that 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 was suffering that was suffering so he did have a suffering childhood as much as I can tell maybe somebody else some other people have some more knowledge and or writing about that and the one point that he made all these marvelous little statements but there was one that I thought was very significant suffering uh, I, I think it was suffering worked through leads to wisdom. He used that in several places, which uh, uh, indicates how much I think he was really telling us how much he suffered. Uh, so, and it all it all comes out, I think, and as you've alluded to uh, very very directly, uh, the compulsion to confess, I think, is really his landmark theoretical piece that was just enhanced and developed as as time went on. But the whole issue of conflict and suffering and turmoil in his childhood is, a, is the underpinning for, for everything that, that, you, that we all have heard today. Thank you. Thank you, Morton. Carl? Is there a roving mic? Oh, yeah. Wait a second. Oh, bring Any, any, uh, can you hear me with this? Oh, oh, hello, anybody? This is, uh, oh, this is the thing I wanted to ask. What I've heard today as masochism, uh, I sometimes define as creativity. And my slogan for creativity is take a sow's purse and make a sow, say, take a sow's ear and make a sow purse out of it. Mm -hmm. And that's what a lot of creative people mm -hmm. do. Mm -hmm. Now, in the 1960s, I was familiar with a lot of the literature. I no longer am. But at that time, oh. <laughs> I think it's just, oh. At, at that time, uh, some of the work on highly creative mathematicians found that when they went into an institution, they lost some of their creativity. And here again, if this man had joined the large professional groups, he would have had to sub submerge a part of himself to the rules of that society and lost some of the edge of his original thinking. 
do, do you agree or disagree? No, with I, I totally agree yeah. with that. Okay, yeah. so I'm just trying to clarify. No, no, absolutely, that. absolutely. Yeah. Two quick questions. One to, to Danny, uh, or a point. The um, Sabina Spielrein's um, text on the destruction as the cause of becoming. I wonder if it could somehow be linked to this kind of uh, pattern that you see with um, uh, with Reich. The other question I had was for um, Ms. Freeman. Is it the, pres the first person who presented? Yes, I have a question for you. In your book, which I. <laughs> <laughs> In your, in Listen, if you guys would have to call or however you do it nowadays, email or something to Prentice Hall and tell them to give us the 40th anniversary, which it was, was published in 71. And the reason it took so long, if I may say, mm -hmm. is because Dr. Wright was, uh, broke his hip and he got quite sick and I went to visit him in the hospital. And he told me... Yeah. <laughs> and he told me a dream which clearly indicated that he wanted to die. And so I got scared and I did the only thing I knew how I yelled at him. And I said, how dare you? I've made enemies I don't yet deserve just because you and I are working together. How could you want to die already? And he said, well, because I'm really finished. And I said, no, we're not. We have to finish the damn book. And then if I have enemies because you're working with me instead of some of the more established people, then you can go if you want. I mean, <laughs> and, and so what happened was I kind of verschleppt the book. You know, I, I would write chapters of it and I would tape it and then I'd, I'd read it back to him and then whatever it, wa whatever it took to keep it as long as I could. And then when he died on the last day of the year, I think he did because he couldn't live beyond what Freud was. He would have been as old as Freud or older. And I don't think he could tolerate being older than Freud. Anyway, uh, what was the point? Well, it, was a, <laughs> it, was, it wasn't a point, I, it was I, a question. You just get a general idea of why he and I got along, because that's how it was all the time. In that, book, in that book, as I remember, you include a picture that uh, uh, entitled Spinoza being stoned by the Jews. Yes. Okay. He and did. I, I've tried to wish. do research on this picture. Uh, he says in that book, if I recall correctly, that it was in Freud's office, or, you, or whoever wrote the book, says that that picture was in Freud's office, that Freud had a, that picture in his office. So the question that I have is, who painted this picture, and whose office was it? Was it Freud's office? Or you mean where he originally oh, saw it? Spinoza. And is it Spinoza no, who, or the other one? Well, you, you have a copy of it, so I'm guessing that's... You no, I don't have a copy of there's it. There's a copy of it there in the book. Yeah, a copy of the picture. The picture, But yeah. the picture itself... Where is that probably picture? probably in the kind of... It's, like in one of the <laughs> it's in Holland. I don't, I, one? I don't know. Spinoza was in Holland. No, it hasn't... No, no, but, no, it's, it's a, it's a, yeah. it's a but it was a picture of a painting. It wasn't the, It was a reproduction. It wasn't know, the original. you're trying to trace it. But it, it doesn't mention who painted the no. painting right. or no. where it is. The, supposedly no. there's one copy of it, and in the book it says it was in Freud's office. In Freud's office, yes, yes. and a copy of it was in it's Reich's like office. So Reich had a copy of the original. Yes, it wasn't the original. The okay. Uh, ma maybe it was, is it, if it's Spinoza, I don't know, maybe this... Well, because I'm very interested in the relationship between Spinoza and psychoanalysis. Second, because... No, I think that, that was not really the relationship. The relationship is that he was a Jew being stoned. Yeah. Well, I mean, no? that's, that, that would be the other point, that the Jews were the first to recognize psychoanalysis. If Freud was somehow identifying with Spinoza, Lacan identified with Spinoza. But I don't think that Freud ever identified with Spinoza. It wasn't that the Jews were identified, it was that the Jews discovered it. One of the problems Jews have is that every time, every so often a Jew appears, after which you can no longer see the world the same way. Not after Moses, not after Jesus, not after Freud, not after Marx, not, not after Einstein. Every so often somebody comes along and it's not possible to see the world as it was and that's very difficult for the world, no? But I'm sorry, I wish I knew, but I don't know. As to, as to Freud and Spinoza, there's a letter from the 1930s, can't remember the exact date, um, of someone um, 
writing to Freud, and because Freud would receive these random letters from people, right, saying, um, why do you never mention Spinoza? Why don't you engage with Spinoza? And Freud famously said, um, it's not because I don't mention him that I don't engage with him. Yeah? Just because Spinoza isn't there doesn't mean that psychoanalysis doesn't rely on Spinoza. And he goes on to say, um, Spinoza is, is, is there from the beginning to, to the end, and, and that's why I don't quote it all the time. So, But anyway, to answer your question, um, Reich was familiar with, with Zamina Spielrein's uh, paper. I, I don't know exactly when uh, he read it, uh, because he wasn't there when, when she presented it at the Vienna Cyclic Society in, in 1913. But he definitely read it afterwards. And Reich wasn't, wasn't very good at crediting people. Um, and uh, apart from Freud, obviously, but but otherwise, uh, throughout throughout his books, uh, and and of course, apart from the literati, you know, like Flaubert and and, and Anatole France, um, but he rarely quotes fellow psychoanalysts. Um, so I, I can't pinpoint exactly. Um, where, if at all, he would draw on uh, Sabina Spielrein's paper on the, uh, uh, the, the structure of life and, and the cause of being. But he was definitely familiar with it. Hi, I'm uh, curious if anybody knows. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. I'm curious if anybody knows, uh, speaking of obscure analysts and the uh, compulsion to confess, if uh, uh, Theodore Reich ever had any uh, relationship with George Grodek, um, the Czech uh, writer of the, the, uh, um, the book of the uh, It. There's apparently a footnote in this book. <laughs> oh, okay. I'll go home and read it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I was curious about that. No, Grodek was based in Grodek was based in Baden-Baden in in the late twenties, and to the best of my knowledge, um, there's only one letter between Reich and and, and, and Grodek, from uh, which was written shortly after uh, Grodek published. Uh, Das Buch vom S, the, 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 the book of, of the It, I think it's translated into English. Yeah. And, it, you know, it, it, it's quite appreciative, but I haven't found any evidence that the conversation continued or, or that they indeed met each other and, uh, and, and that there was some form of in intellectual influence there. Yes, uh, I'm fortunate in having been able to have obtained a copy of Erica Freeman's book directly from her. But when I have recommended the book to others and they have tried to obtain it at bookstores and all, uh, they haven't been able to get it. And I didn't realize it until she said that this is the 40th anniversary of the book. So it would be lovely if all of you people contacted Prentice Hall and told them as to, to commemorate the 40th anniversary of Dr. Reich's book with uh, Dr. Freeman, that they should reissue it. Wouldn't that be nice? Thank you. <laughs> yes, um, I want to thank very much the panel, um, the, the three inspiring presentations. Oh, sorry, yeah. Donna, sorry. <laughs> And, uh, and uh, very much the whole meeting. I, I have very much enjoyed it. It's my first time at NCAP. Um, I am um, very curious about further thoughts that you could share with us, Danny, about um, training and transmission of psychoanalysis, particularly because uh, Theodore Reich was such an inspirational, polemic, conflictive, but inspirational and innovative. And um, and in the ways of an ancestor pre pre-existed um, influence in Lacan. And I'd like to know what you think about the parallel of had Lacan been not excommunicated from the IPA, um, would that have affected his creativity, innovation, school, and so on of the Lacanian movement in, in France? But in general, um, this paradox of mm, creativity, if 
being always contrasted against some type of uh, negativity mm -hmm. in order to arise mm -hmm. itself, no? Or, um, well, there are interesting parallels to be drawn between R Reich's uh, struggle, if you can call it that, with the establishment and, and Lacan's uh, position. Um, and, and I think an argument can be made in favor of the idea that R R Lacan, too, uh, went through his most creative period shortly after finding himself excluded um, by cyclic officialdom, or indeed sometimes at the hands of his own people. Uh, or indeed, sometimes as a result of he himself uh, dissolving the organization which he had created. Uh, I mean, Theodor Reich obviously never went that far, um, but as, as you know, um, other people, this, this may be new, but in, um, uh, shortly before his death, uh, Lacan announced, uh, la solution, c'est la dissolution. Uh, the solution is dissolution. Uh, and he took it upon himself to uh, dissolve the, the school that he had created and had, that had existed for uh, a good 16 years uh, by then, uh, saying that uh, over time it, it, ha it, it was no longer operating in the true spirit of Freud. He said there are too many Lacanians in the school. <laughs> right? Uh, and because there are all these Lacanians who quote Lacan, um, the school has started to look more like a church than a proper cyclic organization. Now, to the best of my knowledge, um, uh, apart from the NPAP uh, and the Theodore Reich Mental Hygiene Center, and this, I think there's a center in Philadelphia that uh, was established through uh, Reich's inspiration, um, Reich did not take any other institutional initiatives. Um, but interestingly, um, as I said in the paper, um, he also tended to distance himself from his own institution. You could say, well, um, in order to find the time to write and to pursue his creative spirit, or in order not to become too bogged down in, in what he no doubt would have regarded as the stifling bureaucracy and, and, and the legalistic procedures of, of running an institution. So there are interesting parallels to, to, to be drawn there. And, and as I said, you know, we, we'd only speculate what would have happened if he had been accepted, but um, I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, if Reich, had he been accepted by the New York Psycholytic, uh, would have <coughs> done something uh, to, uh, to, to turn his own position in, in, into uh, something simultaneously uh, more uh, marginal and, 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 and more uh, productive. Uh, it's almost a position of what Lacan would have called the, the, the extimate, you know, it's, it's, it's operating as an outsider on the inside. You know, so yeah, I'd like to say I'm, I'm being asked to restate the question, so uh, at the risk of uh, you're not being able to uh, not being able to quote you verbatim, uh, the question the question is about um, the, the paradigm, the modernist paradigm of the um, exposure of the establishment as a bourgeois uh, system, which uh, perhaps has been what was the word you used overused uh, overused. overused. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I think, 
I think what mattered more than anything else for Theodor Reich was the, the mental space to pursue his, his own ideas. Um, in, in what he perceived to be the Freudian spirit. So that's also the paradox, of course, you know? So it's, it's the idea that um, the, the truest Freudian is, is the person who um, at, at, at one point is not just a follower, but, but, but who, who becomes a leader in, in, in himself um, by creatively enhancing the, the theory and the practice. So I think that's what mattered more than than anything else, and perhaps it's also because of that. And I, you know, I, I, I mentioned a couple of things in in the paper that Carl quoted early on. Perhaps it's also because of that 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 I call it intellectual independence. Mm. Um, but it's because of that I think that uh, there is no such thing as Reichian psychoanalysis. Um, but at the same time, if you look at the, the principles that, that Reich pursued and advocated, perhaps Reichian psychoanalysis lives on in many traditions in psychoanalysis, right? Uh, it's not because there is no school that calls itself Reichian psychoanalysis or that the people who call themselves Reichian, uh, that they will not adopt his, uh, his, his ideas. And I think some of them are embedded in Lacanian theory, very much so. It's the idea of the courage not to understand um, Reich also favoured irony as, as a form of interpretation. And he was, I, th I think he was incredibly good at it. Uh, so he would say to a patient, stop lying, I already believe you, for example. <laughs> and it was that kind of thing. Um, so he was, he was incredibly good at that. So this irony, as, as it, he also, which hasn't been mentioned, um, favoured silence. Uh, as a technique of interpretation, wrote a, a very long paper about it in, in, in the 1920s. And I think some of these techniques do live on uh, in, in, in various psychoanalytic uh, schools. There you go. I didn't answer your question. I do apologize. Was it? I think Martin. Martin. Was Martin. I, I would like to warn the group not to accept the idea that exclusion guarantees life success. <laughs> we are somewhat in danger of that. But I think in the last lecture, I, we learned something very important, which I would not like it to get lost. And that is that if you look at the pioneers of psychoanalysis, obviously they all were prob people with very serious personal problems. If you were normal, you would do something else. You <laughs> would not go to Freud. So, but there was no answer to it, and to, uh, Freud was not able, as Ferenczi pointed out to him, to analyze the ambivalence towards him so that you were left with this an enormous problem. So what are we, what are we witnessing? We are witnessing a man with very serious problems struggling all his life to remain productive and creative in spite of this difficulty. And that's true not only for Reich. We have to change our view, our whole of our ancestors. They had a much more difficult time because there was no help available to them for their personal problems, and yet they were enormously under the influence of psychoanalysis without being able personally to be cured by it. I, actually, I, I've been struggling under this same kind of thing, keeping the time down, and I think that is the perfect ending for foreshadowing the present, the legacies of Theodore Reich. Thanks to everyone.